Hi, Ben. You are a web developer. The, the very first one, yes. I think, in my as a true web developer, you know. Uh, usually there are lots oh, of... Oh, wow. Yeah, lots of Java guys here <laughs> on my, on my oh, yeah, podcast. Yeah. yeah. So um, what mm -hmm. interests me, what, what, what was your first computer and how you started programming? My first computer, oh, that was probably... I, I, so I'm 40 years old, so I go way back. My first computer was actually a TI-99 4A. And I remember my dad buying these computer magazines, these basic magazines, and copying and pasting, like, game programming logic into the, the computer. Uh, that extended through the Commodore. Um, my, first, my first experience with actual programming, I think it was in um, high school, uh, I took a a programming class, we were doing basic. And I remember my instructor, he was just like, you got to work on the meat and potatoes, but I was all focused on the visual stuff. And I remember making like a database contact list that I called the purple people picker. And, um, it was, it was completely purple. It was completely ugly, but, uh, that was my first experience with computer programming. Um, since this is a Java podcast, I will mention that a couple of years later, I wanted to learn JavaScript, uh, while I was, while I was in college and I bought a Java book accidentally and I didn't know what I was doing. I, I, I thought I was learning JavaScript, but I was writing Java applets. I was like, I, this isn't for me. I don't know what's happening. Yeah. And, um, you are based in Silicon Valley, right? I, yeah, San Francisco. I live in Oakland, work in San Francisco. Hey, cool. So, um, so, you, so you wanted to start JavaScript and you bought a Java book. So now the question is why yeah. you wanted to learn JavaScript, a book, and why you started with the Purple Contact List database? Mm -hmm. um, I think it, I think like one of the requirements for, I think it was a contact list that we're supposed to make. It was so far back, I don't remember. But I think that was the contact list was what we we're supposed to make. But I just, you know, I wanted to make it more visual. I wanted to, I wanted to play it like you couldn't do much with basic, but I just wanted to play around with colors. And I think, I think that's where I come from. Like that, like I get bored with just like when I was in college, like C++ bored me to tears. And it's because there was no visual element there. It wasn't until I got into more multimedia type thing, combining the visual, the UI side with the programming and making it all come together that, that really excited me. So that's, that's where I'm coming from. Um, what was the second part of your question? I forget. Yeah. I also forgot the question actually. So, <laughs> okay, <right on. laughs> um, so, um, yeah, about the JavaScript. Uh, so you started with basic and what's, what was your road to JavaScript? So what you did after your contact list? Yeah. So, um, in, in college, I, I did a, I tried to do a double major with computer science and, um, electronic media arts communication. But the assembly language uh, class just killed me, so I turned it into a minor. So I was doing a little C++, but like I said, the visual element really, uh, really interested me. So I started learning Macromedia Director, um, which was kind of more multimedia-ish. And um, at the same time, I was trying to learn more web stuff because, you know, between Director, where you could deliver on CD-ROM, and uh, the web, where you could deliver just a web page that anyone can see, um, that aspect really appealed to me. So just like getting getting maximum exposure, just getting my work out there and just sharing it, it just interested in me. So that's, that's why, that's why I took a real interest to the, towards these technologies. Okay. When was it with the Micromedia Director? I'm sorry, what? When, when was it? Which year? Oh, uh, I want to say I started getting into that in 1996. Okay. So as a, this is actually exactly the same time um, as, as I started with, with the web. And, um, oh, right on. Yeah. And uh, so you started with uh, – then you immediately after director, you, your natural extension of, of director was JavaScript, right? Sort of. I So JavaScript – I, I kind of got into JavaScript more when JavaScript started really getting good in the HTML5 days. I've always, I've always been, uh, I've always been a web developer, but for a long stretch there after director, I was into Flash. Um, because like, again, I'm so into like really creative and visual UI that, I mean, Flash was the way to go. So it was kind of like director to a little bit of JavaScript and web, but a lot of Flash. And then once once Flash started waning, um, I, I went hardcore into JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. So um, after Steve Jobs, you know, said that Flash is good for <laughs> disks, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> for yeah, disks yeah. only, then 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 you then you uh, migrated your knowledge to web. Yeah, well, so it wasn't just web; it was. Um, 
I remember, I remember that, I remember that day in like, I think it was like 2011 and, um, I was working at a video publishing company at the time and we were doing all our stuff in flash and all of a sudden, you know, people just weren't after flash players anymore. So I remember doing like, I did, I did some Java stuff with a Android app. I did iOS development for an iOS app. I did an HTML5 video player. Um, I did, I think I dabbled in some Xbox stuff because we were in the publishing business. We had to deliver everything. So it kind of blew up for me at that day after flash kind of started waning. And then um, after that, I kind of drilled in on specifically JavaScript and HTML5. Yeah, okay, so you started with the uh, no serious web in 2011, right? Yeah, I, I think that's fair. And uh, were you a freelancer or you worked for, for, for a company or what was your background? I have for companies. Uh, the companies I've worked for have mostly been um, startups and agencies, and it's only recently that I started working in these big corporate places. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I used to work at um, uh, you know, edutainment for kids. So we we did uh, kids games, like casual games for kids. Um, and then I did some video publishing. Um, and then I and then I came to Adobe. Ah, and you are still at Adobe right now? Yeah, yeah, Adobe's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Actually, this is really cool. I didn't knew that. Um, <laughs> and um, what what's interesting is, um, I was actually I did almost exactly as what you did, but uh, I'm the exact opposite of you. So, um, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I I started with Java, and someone yep. uh, came with a book. It was a really thick book. I remember it was around 1997 or 1996, and mm-hmm. the, and the name of the book was uh, Life Script. And I say, what the okay. hell? Is, yeah, what is the Life Script <laughs> thing? And I was completely not interested. And then I saw Java scripts. Like wow, now I know Java. That's probably a good idea, you know, to, to learn JavaScript. And and I thought uh-huh. they were somehow related, you know. So, okay, Java is very similar yeah, to Java. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and I learned JavaScript. And then later I recognized that they have nothing in common, right? So, um, yeah. It, yeah. It so was I, just... It was just them capitalizing on the Java good name at the time and trying yeah. to get real people in. <laughs> and and I did, you know, the Netscape Suitspot server, um, did some JavaScript programming in the uh, on the servers and then in the front ends, animations. And I was not that interested in, about the visual stuff. It I, I found <laughs> it boring. I said, this is, come on. I meant the whole... The <laughs> Those color, are words. <laughs> yeah, colors. Uh, I, I was really into servers and you know, transactions and concurrency. This mm-hmm. is what... And, and I really like C++, by the way. <laughs> I was really <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> excited about uh, C++, Bjorn Strustrup and all the stuff. But and, and then I really converted to Java. And uh, mm-hmm. also also funny thing is um, I worked for a company and they told me, you know, you really have to do some flash work for us. So, okay, I bought uh-huh. flash, yeah, an open, open flash. And it's like, you know, what the hell is the uh, keyframe? And I look at the keyframe and say, okay, <laughs> where I can write my code? And, and someone told me uh-huh. in the keyframes. It's like, what? I have to search for keyframes <laughs> and then I can write uh-huh. and all my code in the keyframes. And, and I, uh-huh. I was, I was, it is, I thought, this is impossible, you know, to write a reasonable applications <laughs> in keyframes. And this was actually funny. So, so what, what you are saying, I was I, I, exactly, you know, exact opposite experience from yours. Yep. <laughs> no, I remember. I remember the, uh, the the whole keyframe thing. Like, yeah, I, I worked with lots of animations and interactivity with those animations. So keyframes were keyframes were key for that. But um, yeah, I remember. I remember like growing up with director and the professors teaching you like, all right, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna try to do this whole thing without keyframes. Stick it all in the global namespace and uh, do things that way. So we were trying to get away without keyframes to do some like you know fancy tricks. But yeah, keyframes are a little bit of a yeah, they're tricky for people that are don't don't that aren't familiar with them. Yes, and after after Flash, there was another tool. I forgot it was like more serious tool. It was uh, Adobe. It was it was not Director. What was it? It was um, uh, more after like, Flash. I'm not sure. After Flash, yeah, it was like a uh, type safe JavaScript. So did they, they, they? There was action script. Mm. Are you thinking of a TypeScript? No, 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 no. It was still Adobe okay. product. It was like you know. I was still. A- yeah. Oh, uh, oh! You thinking maybe animate CC? I think because that's what Flash became after. So, like Flash transitioned to being a purely animation tool, um, rather than like a a entire ecosystem, like a Flash player or plugin and um, animation tool. There was a tool based on the Flash uh, Flash uh, Flash player, but it was serious programming tool. You could wrote code in Eclipse with plugins, and it was oh. 
Yeah, was, okay. Maybe you're thinking of Flash Builder. Flash Builder, ex- exactly. Flash Builder, yeah. probably. You could write a you know, type safe JavaScript almost. It was about to be mm-hmm. standardized. And uh, th- there was some work going on with that. I actually forgot the name. It was not Flash. It was Adobe product based on Eclipse, but it ran on, mm-hmm. as a, on a, pl- a Flash player. It was type safe. There was data binding. There was, uh, and um, yeah. Do, can, can, so I mean, Flash, Flash, uh, like ActionScript is well. I guess it always hasn't been type safe, but in ActionScript three, it was type safe. Um, and you like there was an Eclipse based editor that called Flash Builder that you yes. would. And, and, and like Flex, it used to be called Flex, Flex Builder. Be- Flex. Okay, this so is the name. Flex, Flex. is there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's more like the framework, and they it's it's confusing. The, the 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 naming has always been confusing, but it's Flex was like the 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 UI component tool for building like kind of enterprise the applications. They started with Flex Builder because that's kind of what they were intending for this Eclipse based thing to make. But then they translation to Flash Builder and Flash Builder Four. So and they 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 shuffled the names constantly. <laughs> yeah. So I was a little bit involved with Flex. So I built a, a backends for Flex uh, with uh, Java mm. and they used um, our backends. And yeah. uh, what's what's uh, actually remarkable? Lots of you know UI designers coming actually from Flash or Flex. Mm-hmm. Uh, even the animation framework I think is Greenfoot, right? Greenfoot. Oh, was it Greensock? Greensock. Greensock. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, okay. It was also started you know with Flash and then and then um, migrated to uh, JavaScript. So now, yeah, yeah. So now you're working for Adobe, and um, you've wrote yep. a, a book about web components. I'm also yeah. very, very interested in web components. Actually, I do web components and web startup all the time. And the reason awesome. for th- yeah, and the reason for that is um, I, I do a li- lots of backgrounds, uh, back backgrounds, uh, back ends <laughs> with and microservices. And my mm-hmm. clients ask me now, what do we do in the front end? Because um, in yeah. Java there was Java server faces where the, I mean, you, you can do uh, no no. Create, read, update, delete, boring applications, but impossible mm-hmm. to build something offline or you know more uh, interactive. And we have also yeah. J- JSPs, which are great for server side rendering, but this is not a front end framework. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know whether you know there is some you know uh, uh, I would say more or less terrible frameworks like Angular, <laughs> which uh, which uh, I uh, Angular was my last framework I was using before I came to web components. <laughs> okay, Angular one. Was great. Yes, but Angular two, I have no idea. I know what they did. This is like okay. you know. Well, I stopped. I stopped in Angular one. No, no problem. But Angular JS was. I think it was. It was great. And Angular mm-hmm. two, four, five, six, seven looks to me like you know, uh, uh, how to call it? You know, a board enterprise Java developers try you know to migrate one to one old <laughs> application servers from from nineteen fifties to to the web. This is my impression. What happened? So to to get okay. the hello world, you have to download. 25,000 you know files just just to get something on screen and okay. by the way this is a running joke but it's no kidding um mm-hmm. the first time my uh, my uh, backup stopped working is just because I, I installed one angular and the node module was so big that the night was too short you know to to back up everything <laughs> with time machine so i had uh-huh. and it's like what's going on and and then i recognize you know i have to exclude the node modules from backup yeah i mean that's a common problem i don't think it's an angular problem. i i hesitate to smack talk any framework uh every I, I feel like every framework has their place that said i don't have experience with uh beyond angular v1 uh, but I think the the node modules is a common problem, and you know uh, that that's kind of why I like this like plain vanilla like no frills, uh, just write some JavaScript and put it up on a page, and um, I, I that's that's really what I'm taking to. And there's no there's not really any dependencies for doing this until you get. I mean, like there's production tasks. So once you get to production, you want to concatenate stuff and build stuff. That's another story, but that's you know, you just you honed in on exactly the reason why I just like web components and and uh, just developing uh, applications without a framework. Exactly. So and um, so what 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 happened to me is um, so I, I look at you know in the at the f- framework landscape and I think. Like, you know, suggesting Angular for enterprise clients also means they mm-hmm. will potentially have, you know, to migrate twice a year because there is a mm-hmm. major release twice a year with minor yeah. breaking changes. But, you know, they could be breaking changes. And um, React is far more stable. This this would be actually an option. But mm-hmm. um, and and then I, I come from, 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 from the back end. And in the back end, we have, a, a I would say, a standard called Java E. And this is like a set of APIs which are using 
and they are not changing mm -hmm. a lot. So the, my clients yeah. are, no, are, are, are custom to stable APIs that don't like the migration without a reason. So and mm -hmm. um, I, I knew JavaScript from back then, and what I observed is that JavaScript becomes more and more like Java. So we had you no know, ES6, we had classes, we had uh, mm -hmm. modules which behave like import statements in Java. So it is actually almost identical to modern Java. And mm -hmm. uh, I really like what I saw. And then with web components, which uh, are also similar to Java component model, like in the old Swing okay. or a a a AWT a little bit, I mean, from programming mm -hmm. model. Mm -hmm. And I really like that. And I would say since 2015, what I do is uh, exclusively web standards programming for the web. And um, cool. with without any frameworks and and it it mm -hmm. works surprisingly well but i was uh, more or less alone so i was really glad <laughs> so manning you know approached me and they asked me hey um uh what um uh, they, they suggested a book and i say okay this book is a little bit you know boring do you have something about you know <laughs> web components uh, sure uh, uh -huh. they, and they directed <laughs> yeah. me to you to to ben you know ben farrell and yep. now, now we are talking and 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 what i see amazing exactly what you said is I have zero dependencies. What I usually use is, um, you know, uh, custom elements, which are supported everywhere. Then yep. uh, CSS3, which uh, um, even com comes, you know, with properties. So we have variables. So there is no need for SAS, less, or stylus anymore for, mm -hmm. for enterprise Thank apps. you. That, I'm, I'm exploring a lot of CSS lately. And, yeah, I, I was just writing a blog post where I was just like, I kind of feel weird about saying, I don't want to use less or SAS. They're awesome. But I keep coming back to basic CSS. So I agree completely. Yeah, I have to say thank you to you because, you know, I'm a, <laughs> I, I'm a you know, boring enterprise developers i don't i don't need a lot of funky funky stuff you know you have a form validation some you know some asynchronous uh, request response communication with the back end so we, we mm -hmm. don't so sas and having function or something is really i mean we really don't need it and um mm -hmm. so we have web components and uh templating is a little bit uh, there is nothing there so what we use currently is lit html without polymer yep. just you know plain library nothing else and uh, mm -hmm. if it will die, I will switch to hyper HTML or take mm -hmm. something else. So this is the, yep. the you know, fallback. But, you know, yeah. the whole lit HTML is like 500 lines of code. So my clients, yeah. they're, they're absolutely safe because uh, in the worst possible case, you can maintain it by your own, you know. It's not like uh, yeah. this is a rocket science. Yep. So, so lit HTML, I, I, <laughs> I, I kind of went a little crazy with no dependencies. So I, it took me a little bit to warm up to lit HTML. Um, I was actually like in my book I cover um, how to how to do templating. So I I use actually just the template literal and I stick it all on a module that handles the HTML and CSS only. And you bring that into the com component and just set the inner HTML to those strings. Um, when I started using lit HTML a little more, I realized oh yeah, you don't have to slam the inner HTML at all at once with this big long string if you repeatedly update it. So there's a little bit of nuance there. So if you you need to repeatedly update things. You're a little bit lazy about knowing which things are updating, which things aren't updating. Lit HTML is great because it just replaces what needs to be replaced, and that's that. So, I think there's, you know, I think it's a great solution if you if you need that type of thing. Yeah, what I did was lit HTML one just for fun as a huge table, and I re-rendered mm -hmm. the table. I think 60 frames per second or something, and I changed uh -huh. you now only view cells, and it was could still keep up because uh, it just renders what really changed. So this is uh, yep. interesting, and it's also very memory efficient because we don't have you know to maintain two parallel DOMs and and make the diffs. It it works differently to uh, to Visual DOM in Angular or React. Yep, but uh, straight. Um, ES6 uh, template literal would never work in my projects. The problem is you could okay. hack you could hack the application, you know. So what can happen mm -hmm. is that the developer binds to, for instance, to an image, and what mm -hmm. you can do on error, you know, and 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 introduce cross site scripting attacks where mm -hmm. lit HTML escapes that, but not ES6. Okay. So it's safer. See I'm lucky. I, 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 I'm a prototyper at Adobe, so I'm not so worried about security in my daily uh, work. So. Thank you for <laughs> thank you for talking about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is a huge topic in in my project. You know that uh, mm -hmm. uh, because you know the Java developers are not as you know excited about colors. They just would like to to to, to make it work. And yeah. uh, there is another killer feature of lit HTML is uh, event binding, right? So without lit, yeah, without lit HTML, you will have to look up the element, and with mm -hmm. lit HTML, you you can say you know at click or at uh, change 
and it will bind automatically to the events, which is actually mm -hmm. a huge time saver. Yeah, you know, I, I, I like that feature, the event binding. The, I'm just not used to the syntax. Um, and I, I go back and forth on it. So I have a little, uh, I have a little helper utility myself that kind of after the fact maps events that you want to. So you'd, you'd mark a, you'd mark a HTML element with an attribute that would bind, like a click. It would just say click and it would, it would kind of query the DOM and look for things that need to be wired up and, and automatically do that. So that's a helper library I wrote. Um, and I'm just not, I just don't know about that syntax because it's not, I like having pure HTML and pure CSS. Um, just because, just because I am so visual, I can, I can take that HTML out, take that CSS out, try it on a web page, get the, get the look right before it gets into my application and, and, uh, you know, just, just get it right. Um, so yeah, I go back and forth on that. Okay, but what your library is doing? So you have like you are parsing the DOM tree and and hooking the uh, the event listeners, or what are you doing? Yeah, so I mean, this is just this is just an, like uh, a thing I've been dabbling with. It's just uh, so you you have an H, you have some HTML, and um, on one of those HTML elements that you want to have clicked, uh, you say okay, like I have an attribute called wire, and I say wire equals click, and then. Um, that gets passed back to the, the library and it just like goes through your entire DOM and says, Hey, uh, this, this thing is marked wire and it says click. So I'm going to add a uh, event listener, a click event listener to that after the fact. So it's not part of the markup. Um, and I could, I could see it going either way. Um, cause little HTML is nice, but, um, yeah, like I said, I just like to have my HTML and CSS pure so I could try them out elsewhere outside the scope of the application. So what you are doing is uh, you have a data attribute, right? So like data wire. Yeah. And, and then do you have... No, it's not, it's, it's not necessarily a data attribute. It could be. Um, it's just an attribute. Okay. And, and you just use a query selector all, give me, you know, all elements with wire. And then, you know, that they, 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 they would like to listen to changes, right? Exactly, and I do I do something similar with um, just getting a, getting a references to the DOM elements that I want to re refer to for other purposes as well. So it get, I get back a dictionary that just contains like key is the name of the element that I assign to, and then the 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 value is the element. Um, so I just have some small helper utilities for myself that I do that stuff with. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, reasonable and and the lit html the code is inside the component right so you have a component and let's say method uh render and what you do then is the, uh, you have the template which is pre-parsed and you're passing the template mm -hmm. to the render function from lit html right yeah yeah when I, when i use when i use lit html yeah yeah and um you're a designer so what's your opinion about you know having everything in one place so that in custom element contains the markup and the business logic. Are you fine with that? No. I, well, like I said, I, I like to... I like to um, create a separate module that I've been calling templates, and um, that module gets imported by the the custom element class. So um, all the HTML and CSS lives in this separate module, and um, yeah, it's okay. I it, see. It seems to separate it out pretty nicely. Okay, because um, this is also interesting. In some projects. Uh, uh, people or, or developers really like the separation where they would like to mm -hmm. have templates separate. And this was also the same story with Java server faces. There was back and forth. Some developers would like to have, you know, the markup completely separated. There were other frameworks where the markup and the presentation logic had to have the similar structure. And for mm -hmm. me as a developer, what I really appreciate is everything having in one place. So what I really like is have a custom element with embedded template because, you know, I can look at the entire thing, and if I have refactor something, I, I don't have to move, you know, between two files. I had a really bad, okay. exp bad experience as a Java developer, so I would say <laughs> 15 years ago, there was lots of XML, and if something changed, you always have to sync, you know, two files. So now I'm really mm -hmm. glad, you know, the React, uh, um, the React uh, idea that uh, React also encapsulates, you know, the markup and the uh, business logic in one class. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, so this is what I like a little bit more. I think that's fine, and I think that speaks to like how web like how web components can serve everybody. You have your approach, I have my approach. We're both using web components, and it's it's fine. Um, but I think I think the the one of the reasons I like it separated out too is because someday I 
I'm pretty sure someday we're going to get uh, HTML imports and, uh, or sorry, not imports, CSS modules and HTML modules that you can import, which is going to leave HTML as HTML and CSS as CSS, and we can just use the straight files and import them. So that's, that's what I'm hoping for soon to improve my workflow. But again, it's separate files, and you might not like that. You might want to keep it in your class, and I, that's still valid. You, you mentioned CSS. Um, are you aware of Houdini? Houdini. Oh, uh, that, yeah, I, I have mean to try that. That's the, that's the Mozilla, uh, ne tech, no, no. Houdini, is, Houdini, I guess, will be your next mm -hmm. book. So <laughs> what, <laughs> what Houdini is, is this like a, a way to interact with the CSS engine from browser, which is web standard. It's like, you know, custom mm -hmm. elements for HTML markup is like Houdini for CSS. This is more or less yes, what I see. I remember that. So and what you can do with Houdini, you can hook into how browser renders, you know, uh, let's say you, what you can create, you can create, create your own CSS classes with, mm -hmm. uh, with own behavior. So you can, you, can, yeah. you can render shapes which are impossible right now with straight, uh, with straight CSS. Yeah. I remember seeing that talk at the, I went to a Chrome Dev Summit last year. Um, I remember seeing that and being really excited about it. But then I went home and I'm like, it's just in Chrome. I want it to be everywhere. I don't. I don't want to create a Chrome only application. So yeah, it's exciting, but I just need it to be everywhere. Yeah, it it will be everywhere, but you know the mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Chrome is not trailblazer as as as, as open. Yeah, 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 yeah. And what's your take, you know, on frameworks or not? So um, I use a lot of web components, and I have to say, I'm mm -hmm. completely happy. So I I do not miss yeah. anything. So I, I yeah. Yeah. So and 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 you are also saying yeah. So which um, which makes me glad because uh, it seems like you know. Developers really like frameworks, and I see less and less, you know, a need for a framework for common application. A common application, as I said, is enterprise apps is in my world. And even mm -hmm. if you would create something like, uh, I don't know, a an, an podcast player or whatever, there's even more so that the, the, the app is simpler. You have one view, and, and the most what I could imagine just, you know, to take Redux or something, you know, to, to, to manage the, the data flow somewhere. But... Mm -hmm. I don't see, you know, any need for frameworks. I don't either. Well, I think it, I think it all comes down to what type of application you're working on. Like you, uh, okay, I'll, I'll have to take your word for it because you're the one that's working on enterprise applications. I'm working on more visual prototypes. Uh, in in my world, I'm I'm not. I, I see more an app the the framework as a hindrance, trying to tweak the framework into what I need to do. That's kind of non standard because I'm working on a new visual type interaction type. Um, so I haven't needed frameworks, um, and again, I feel like they kind of get in the way for what I specifically do. Um, I've heard you know web components don't have this feature, like maybe they don't have routing or server side rendering, um, and. You know, I just haven't needed those features in my stuff. And if you do need those features, that's great. If you need a bunch of those features, feel free to use a framework. I'm not saying there's like, I, I think there's a right tool for the right job. And I think it's great that we have so many tools between Angular, React, Vue, uh, web components, um, everything. I, I don't know, a few months ago, I had to teach um, Java developers to build an enterprise app and we needed a router. Mm -hmm. And I knew there are already web components, which are a great web components with router functionality. Like, like for instance, there is a Vardin router, which uh, is a web mm -hmm. a custom element with routing. But yep. um, you know, if you if you take a ready to use web component, a router is a really complex stuff because um, what router does, you know, there is an event, it reacts to the event. Usually, what happens, you can you know register. A, a JavaScript function before out, after out. So you have guards. You you would like to have authentications or um, or sorry authorization that only particular roles are able you know to route to this item to the menu item. Mm -hmm. And uh, we actually decided to to write a very simple router. All we need from scratch as a custom element. And mm -hmm. I actually also did it in my video course just for fun. But this in the project was cool. a little bit more complicated. And um and it was I think. As I remember, 55 lines of code. Yeah. I and mean, I, I, I was writing event. I, I wrote an event bus that's about similar to yeah. that. Uh, and, and yeah, it's just, it's easy. And, and you could, um, and I started with the funky way because uh, what I wanted to have a generic router. So what you could do, of course, you could um, dynamically import, you know, the views to the router. 
which was mm-hmm. uh, overkill because in enterprise world you already know that you have no five menu items there will be never more or less and if yes then you can add an item manually so what i did i removed the uh, mm-hmm. removed the generic and asynchronous stuff and replaced that with just switch statements so you know on event you know login go to login route on event log out so there were like you no know, 10 items but the great story was it was completely obvious what's going on and it was very it was also very, very easy, you know, to remove items, show items. You know, we, we had a custom behavior just with if-else statement. It's ex- extremely easy to test. And I asked the developers multiple mm-hmm. times, are you missing anything here? And they said, <laughs> no, no, we are perfectly glad. So yep. I said, okay, this this was actually for me a reassurance <laughs> that we don't need much, you know, because if you if you would use ready-to-use um, uh, um, generic router, I think we would spend more time learning what this thing is actually doing than, than programming business logic. Mm-hmm. I think you touched on something key there is like the, the, the big frameworks, they do magic under the hood and the magic, uh, the magic they do under the hood has the best intentions and it's great, but it's just stuff you don't know is happening that's going on under there and it causes unintentional things and it's hard to debug. So yeah. And I have an, an a, suspicion or my, my, my impression is that a JavaScript at the beginning was like, you know, what was like, how to call it, um, no one took JavaScript seriously. It was JavaScript was even worse than Visual Basic mm-hmm. at the beginning. So actually, in some, proje- yeah, in some <laughs> projects, uh, I did JavaScript, but uh, if you, at least in Europe, you know, if you said, I know JavaScript, you were out. It's like, a, what? JavaScript? This is not a <laughs> language, right? And my, my impression uh-huh. is right now, that the uh, JavaScript framework people and the Node.js developers, they would like to show off a little bit and see, see, we are now a real language with real patterns. We do modules, whatever you can, we can do it as well. And they exaggerate a bit mm-hmm. so that they know that they, they implement a fusion reactor to have create, read, update, delete, you know, just, um, just, just to show how, <laughs> how great the language is. This is a bit my impression. I don't know. I know it's, pro- it's completely exaggerated, but this is what, what I see. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, there's, there's a JavaScript is, is, you know, so, it, it's so multifaceted. Like you were talking about classes before. So we have that, but then other people, you know, they hate classes. They want more functional style of writing things. And JavaScript just like seems to accommodate everybody. Um, so it is kind of amazing. And it, it did grow up a lot. Um, and just the, just the entire ecosystem grew up a lot. I mean, I'm basically when I was doing flash, it was because you couldn't do that stuff on the web. And I remember doing like, you know, even when I was doing flash games, uh, for some of the, the, my clients, it was just like, yeah, I had to do like tables based HTML layout, which was just awful. And I hope everybody forgets that existed. Um, it was just super painful back then. And that, and that's part of the reason why I love flash so much is because you could express yourself creatively. And I feel like now, um, for the past several, Several years, you can do the same things with HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. So it's it's a really big win. And um, also interesting is the granularity of custom elements. So um, uh, for me, I use custom elements like to structure the application. So what I usually have is a custom element with the name, mm-hmm. footer, header, uh, navigation, content. So it's more like semantic markup, like you know, replacement yep. of uh, of how it's called, so visual structure. And then, and I'm mm-hmm. not very into no reusability or just I'd ignore all the things. I, I just use a structure, structural, <laughs> uh, structural mean. And this, this, this works uh-huh. very well for me. So, what is your approach? Uh, yeah. Are your components finer, or, or what's you know what's the granularity? What is an example of of your typical custom element? Yeah, I guess similar depending on what I'm doing. So since I'm prototyping, I'm not worried about I'm wor- I'm worried about speed and development rather than reusability. And I, I do a similar thing. Um, and I just build my application up like yeah, here's a side nav component. My application component holds everything else, and my main area component is is named as such. But being a prototyper though, it's kind of weird because like, um, you know, things have to shuffle all the time. My side nav becomes my footer and my footer becomes my header. And like the, the, the like designs change. So like I have to rename stuff all the time. So it's just, it can become a mess, but it would become a mess anyway, really. Um, so that's what I'm doing. But when I'm, uh, you know, when I'm trying to do something that I, I mean to share out, um, 
like uh, some of the stuff in my book, I give a proper namespace to the project. Like my book is called Web Components in Action. So I give it a namespace, WCIA for every component in the book. And I do some um, best practices called reflection um, where every attribute can be accessed by a getter and setter as well. Um, and they're all the same. Um, so there's no confusion. So I, you know, when I, when I try to show best practices, I really go try to do best practices, but in my daily work, I, it's just, you know, I go for speed. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I didn't knew that this, the pattern is called reflection because reflection in Java means something else, mm -hmm. but I did exactly the same in uh, yeah. my video course. And, and, and the reason for that is because there's the expectation that the attributes are reflected to properties to exactly. Yeah. This is how, you know, there is like, uh, how, how, how it should behave. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's well, so it's it's kind of weird because it's like if you take an input element, it's not the same with the the browser's input element. So like the the value can't be accessed the same way. Um mm. but that's what the that's what they want you to do in web components is to like be cons uh, consistent like that. So yeah. And what's your take on Shadow DOM? Are you using Shadow DOM a lot? So, uh I I have one of my one of my prototypes right now that I've been working full time on is around a year old and the problem with the Shadow DOM is that it wasn't supported in, in all browsers. Now we're finally to the place where um, once once um, Edge comes out with their consumer version, you can already get Edge uh, uh, the Chromium backed Edge um, and developer preview. But now we have Shadow DOM supported everywhere. So I have this year old project that I want to upgrade, but uh, I just have to have time to do it. The other problem with the Shadow DOM is I've been exploring this in the past couple of weeks is um, if you want to use a design system, remember the Shadow DOM keeps out style, which is great because it doesn't, you don't get conflicting CSS selectors and style creeping in. But what if you want style to creep in? Well, if you use a design system, you do want that to happen. Um, so design systems with the shadow dom for me like they just weren't usable so that's kind of kept the shadow dom at bay for some of my work but i've been i've been trying some stuff out with uh, a new feature in chrome called uh, constructible style sheets where you can you know create new style sheets css style sheets and just adopt them into your shadow dom based web component and everything just works it's amazing and i i'm going to blog about that pretty soon um so that's that's why i haven't gone Full on Shadow DOM just yet, but I really want to because it's really awesome. Yeah, it's exactly the same what what we do in projects because you know we Java developers we don't like CSS a lot. I mean, there is there we get CSS mm -hmm. from somewhere, and if you would yeah. hide, you know, use Shadow DOM, it would not apply to all the elements which we actually sometimes really want. So my advice would mm -hmm. be, you know, to, to get rid of Shadow DOM at the beginning completely in enterprise project and then see what happens. Mm -hmm. And if you need the encapsulation, then you can either copy, you know, the CSS or ex expose attributes, CSS attributes. And so you can, you can, you can configure them from outside. Um, but mm -hmm. uh, I think if you would start with Shadow DOM, it is, it is just too much, you know, because uh, you, you will have to think about every the CSS cas cascade doesn't work anymore, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 a little hard going back and forth between the Shadow DOM and not Shadow DOM because if you start with the Shadow DOM, there, like when I start with the Shadow DOM, I like to like stick a bunch of logic, like my setup, uh, my render logic in the constructor, which you can't do without a Shadow DOM, and then um, uh, I'm trying to think what else. Um, yeah, there's oh the other thing I'd like to do is like I like to like use IDs instead of like weird classes to identify things in my component. And you can't really use IDs without the Shadow DOM because it's gonna conflict with everything else in your page. So I'm kind of I kinda of like being more lazy using the Shadow DOM with my like like little uh, mini DOM world. Um and you just you can't take that practice if you're not using the Shadow DOM. Yes. Um with Shadow DOM, this is actually there is one benefit of Shadow DOM if you if you put you know CSS aside and what 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 it is mm. is um, you have the shadow root and you can perform query select or something and it is scoped mm. to the Shadow DOM so um, you don't even yep. need ID let's imagine we have a component with just a button so what you can do then you can say no this query selector button and you get the only button back because there's only one button in, inside the component you know it you know so you don't even know ids yeah so there's a, yeah basically. that's the other side of things i use a lot of divs that i i use ids on but yeah for sure like just a button like you can just query select that button and you're fine with the shadow dom 
Hey, you mentioned um, diffs. What we try to do is, you know, diffs are almost forbidden. So what we focus on, okay. you know, section and um, mm. an article yeah, semantic. and yeah, semantic. Because if you just have diffs, it is really hard, you know, to parse the structure of the page. But um, as you already mentioned, mm -hmm. you you are prototyping a lot. So by the way, yep. what are you building? What is is what you, what your prototype is doing? Can you talk about that? I can kind of hand wave it a little bit. So uh, my prototyping team is working with Adobe's Project Arrow right now on a prototype that I can't really describe. Okay. <laughs> and, pro and Project Arrow is Adobe's new augmented reality effort. Ah, and um, in one day, if it will came out in a few weeks or months, so we can just re-record mm -hmm. another episode of this podcast so you can talk more freely about the project, right? Yeah, I'd, have, I, I'd be happy to as long as I check and make sure that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, okay, <laughs> build systems. You mentioned this already. And um, what I mm -hmm. use, we um, this is also funny. So um, for development, what I what I really like is uh, I don't know whether you know browser sync. So what browser sync does, it just reloads you know the CSS pages and uh, and pushes them to the browser. So I have Visual mm -hmm. Studio Code and uh, browser sync um, running in background. This is a a small browser and the browser sync is uh -huh. usually included in most most of CLIs and it refreshes mm -hmm. all my stuff and ev everyone is fine with that. And for mm -hmm. production, what we do is, so modern browsers, and, and this is also interesting, uh, what changed in recent years, it is absolutely fine, you know, to go with Chrome only in enterprise because you can mm -hmm. ask, you know, the, uh, the users to install Chrome. It's not a big deal. And this the, the issue will be solved with uh, a Firefox is also allowed, uh, but uh, you know the as you already said, the next edge is going to be uh, Chrome decorated Chrome, Chrome yeah. let's say, right? And yep. um, and then the issue is solved. So we 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 don't need any build system, which is even better because you know the 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 the, the whole JavaScript build system is its concatenation is black magic, and mm -hmm. in enterprise system with um, HTTP two. You know, bundling and concatenating uh, doesn't result necessarily in the best possible performance because with HTTP2, it is uh, often faster to deliver, you know, individual files and not, you know, one huge blob. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I'm using, I'm still concatenating, I'm still bundling, I'm using, um, I'm using Rollup to do so. Yes. But I also recognize, I don't know if I have to, I'm not, yeah, yeah. I mean, imports work just it's fine, um, but I've just been bundling out of out of force of habit because that's how we've always been doing things. But I I need to look into more, just like the reasoning and making sure I'm still doing the right thing. But yeah, you're absolutely right. So we I also use Rollup for um, for the older browsers. So if we include the first, you know, JavaScript, there is a type module, and there is also mm -hmm. uh, imports. Uh, sorry, script source type no module as a fallback. And the yep. uh, no, and the module is uh, ignored by uh, by the modern browsers, and the no module is ignored by the uh, by the um, by uh, the, the no, sorry other other way around. But uh, this is the the fallback. Mm -hmm. And for the no module, we use Rollup with Babel plugin. It also transpires mm -hmm. you know the modern JavaScript to the old one. So the, the older browsers there is the polyfills in the web components, polyfills, custom elements. So the uh, old yep. browsers get the own the the old and slower stuff, and the modern browsers get exactly this what we are seeing during development. So there is not even minification go going on. Yeah. So so in my book I do pretty much the same thing. So um, I have a chapter on just build tooling, and I do do the 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 roll up to Babel for the Internet Explorer 11 build, and then um, uh, an another bundle for um, just normal uh, normal stuff, normal modern browsers, and then of course you can just like use the original source import modules for everything else. Yeah. And uh, recently, uh, I, I took a look, and you are aware of Pika, Pika Web? I haven't looked into that. Um, that's the one where it unbundles things, right? Yeah, it's like you have a package JSON, and you can declare modules. So I just uh, try to know mm -hmm. with uh, custom elements and lit HTML, for instance. And if you declare mm -hmm. lit HTML dependency in package JSON and you fire up Pika Web, what it will do, it will pull all the dependencies and copy them to, I think the, the folder name is Web, web Module. But you get one single file, right, yeah. and and this and and the the file can be imported uh, directly. Mm -hmm. So there's not an issue with lit HTML. It's more more issue if you have scoped 
package names in JavaScript, like add right. something. So this doesn't work directly in the browser and the Pika web transpires that that is di directly usable. It's like roll up with, uh, I would say, uh, or, or yeah, with uh, web functionality. So it's actually capable to understand package JSON, download the stuff from the web and, and, and create a ES6 module basically. Cool. I need to look into that more. Yeah, this is uh, really appealing. So, um, uh, yeah. I, uh, because with rollup.js, I have to do something. You know, you have to to to, to prepare a rollup uh, config and uh, explain my clients how to use it. And Pika just works out of the box. The only thing is, you get a folder. I think the name is web module, and uh, you have to mm -hmm. configure browser sync to pull the dependencies from web module folder. Cool. Sounds awesome. <laughs> cool. So now you mentioned a book. So the reason we are speaking here is because um, yes. many approach me and they say, hey, there is an interesting book about web components. And I say, okay, not only interesting book, but also interesting author. You, uh, you had some, yeah. Hollywood, you won an Hollywood award something, right? Emmy or something. <laughs> is, it, is it right? So I, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, I like that. I do like to say I have won Emmys, but it's not me personally that has won the Emmy. It's my projects that have won the ah, Emmys. Ah, what was it? So um, one of the Emmys we won with uh, Sesame... One we won with Sesame Works. Uh, it was, it was uh, cable set-top box game games. So you could watch... You could, like, use your remote and, like, interact with, like, Elmo. Uh, but this was, like, back in 2006. Uh, so it was, it was a really, like... Obviously, like, back then, like, cable set-top boxes were super low-powered. So, like, it was... I think it was, like, some kind of technical Emmy for doing that. Um, and so, yeah. I don't have the statue. Workshop has the statue. Um, but then the other, the other thing we won an Emmy for... I was working at the video publishing company called Digital Smiths, and um, we were working with the PGA Championship in 2011... And I think I think it was like the Emmy was like innovative approaches in sports technology or something. We were basically like uh, live streaming the the PGA Championship uh, throughout over the entire week or weekend, and just offering up n clips of what happened and stuff like that. So yeah, that that won an Emmy as well. Hey, cool. So with the Elmo stuff, you cheated a bit because you know with Elmo, everyone would win an Emmy, right? <laughs> <laughs> i can't i mean sesame workshop is awesome but if you get if you're working on a project with elmo and it's firing from every cubicle in your office for like eight hours a day it does get a little tiresome <laughs> yeah yeah it could even change your accent right huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah cool um so uh now about your book this is uh web components yeah. uh in action yeah and yep. um, web components in action what are you doing in the book? So what is the, you know, the, the chapters of your book? So can you quickly introduce your book to our yeah, listeners? Yeah, sure. So it's, it, it kind of takes the same approach that you and I have been talking about, kind of just <sighs> making web components with no framework, which was, you know, it was kind of lucky I did that because, you know, back when I started writing this book, Polymer was, Polymer was big, the Polymer library. And now they've moved on to the Polymer project, which is all lit HTML and lit elements. So if I talked about Polymer a lot, my book would kind of be outdated. But luckily, I didn't do that. Um, so my book takes you through, like, just making your first web component with um, a custom element and then talks about component reusability, getting into the, the life cycle. Uh, um, and then I get into, um, how to like organize your project through, uh, through ES6 modules. And then I talk about, um, you know, making those modules manage your, your HTML and CSS templates. And, um, then I talk about the shadow DOM and, uh, like using the shadow DOM through JavaScript and, and working with it through CSS and talking about the rough edges around working with shadow CSS. Um, and then I kind of cap the book off with building a, a real world component. I use a color picker, um, and then I talk about building and supporting older browsers and then testing um, and just doing some application and data flow stuff. My last chapter I really like because it kind of brings all the projects in the book together and does some like VR and AR stuff and um, computer, uh, computer vision. And uh, there's a hand tracker that I found online um, 
that uses uh, machine learning and computer vision, and it tracks your hands. And I have this uh, project from Chapter Five where you can play a web. It's, it's a I call it a web harp. You you pluck strings with your mouse, but then in Chapter Fifteen I bring that back, and you can pluck the strings with your actual hand through your webcam. Um, so there's a lot of fun stuff in that last chapter. Yeah, cool. Uh, are you using uh, also uh, no, like um, virtual reality goggles or something like you know Oculus or something like this? Yeah. So um, personally, I in the in the book I talk a little bit about um, using a frame, which is mm -hmm. uh, Mozilla's uh, library for just marking up uh, VR scenes. Personally, though, I'm super into VR. Um, I just got an Oculus Quest. I've been using Tilt Brush. I've been actually just working on a blog post and just drawing diagrams in Tilt Brush, and it's kind of awesome. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm super into VR. Hey, cool. So where people can find you on the internet? So your blog, Twitter, whatever you like. Yeah. Um, uh, so benfarrell.com. It's uh, B-E-N-F-A-R-R-E-L-L.com. You can find me on Twitter at uh, Ben G. Farrell. Um, and I guess, I guess that's about it. <laughs> oh, thank you. It was really ni yeah. nice to meet s someone, you know, from complete different perspective. So we are actually the yeah. opposites, you know. We are the back-end guy, yeah. you are the front-end, and uh, we, <laughs> un we understand each yeah. other. So this was actually interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah, thank you. It was very nice to meet you.